Just ahead on Money in Your Pocket, we kick off the series with Dr. Patrick Locke from Eastern Illinois University. Dr. Locke will be talking to us about ways to get your financial house in order, from evaluating and paying down debt, to saving for an emergency fund, and putting away money for retirement. It's an informative program just ahead, so don't go away. This program is made possible in part by Credit Union One. Proud to support money in your pocket. Credit Union One offers savings and lending options. Additional information on membership available at creditunionone.org. Loans subject to approval. Accounts are insured up to $250,000. By member's choice, this institution is not federally insured. Welcome to the first edition of Money in Your Pocket. I'm your host, Lori Casey. And to get things started on this series, we're welcomed by Dr. Patrick Locke from EIU School of Business. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, today we're talking kind of about how to get our financial house in order. Mm -hmm. But before we get into that, tell the viewers a little bit about your background. Sure, I received my PhD in finance from Mississippi State in 2008. And my first placement out of grad school was here as an assistant professor of finance at Eastern Illinois University. Uh, I was promoted to the rank of associate professor of finance back in April. And I also own and operate Lock Financial, which is a registered investment advisory firm based out of Louisville, Kentucky. So what is it about money and finance that interests you? Well, I was actually, when I started college, I was actually a psychology major. <laughs> and I moved over to finance because everybody thinks they're so different, but Really, finance and investing is nothing more than applied social psychology. Yeah. It's an incredibly interesting field. And that, so, that psychology background kind of fits into that a little bit. Yes, yeah, it does. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about how to get our finances uh, in order. So the ultimate goal, I think, for so many people watching is to be able to retire. Mm -hmm. But before you can start thinking about retirement, you have some other things to think about, which is where we're going to start a discussion. So how should people get started? Well. Really the ultimate goal, like you said, with retirement is, I tell people it sounds morbid, but the goal is to make sure that you run out of life before you run out of money. You want to die with money in the bank. It, again, it sounds morbid, but that's the ultimate goal. And so really to get there, you need to invest. But before you can invest, you also need to make sure that everything else is in order. Like you said, your personal financial house is in order. You want to make sure your debt is low or non-existent. You want to make sure you have an adequate emergency fund and you want to make sure that you're paying attention. And in my experience as an investment advisor, that's probably the number one mistake that people make is not paying attention or at least, let me say, not paying attention to the important things. Mm -hmm. it, it always amazes me that you know, so many people can tell you the price of gas at five different gas stations on any given day. They could tell you to the penny how much they paid per gallon when they filled up a tank of gas, but they can't tell you what their interest rate is on their mortgage. They can't tell you what current mortgage rates are. You know, they might have a $250,000 retirement account and they can't tell you what the expenses are. So that's one of the common mistakes that I see is people are paying attention, but they're focusing on the wrong things like gas prices or how many miles they have on their rewards credit card and not paying attention to the big items. Okay, so if someone say, well, we'll start with paying down our debt. Uh -huh. What advice do you have if someone has racked up maybe a lot of uh, credit card debt, or maybe you're still paying on student loans? What can we do to kind of get that down to a manageable level? Well, when it comes to paying down debt, there's a couple things that I think people need to, need to ask themselves. Number one is it's incredibly important to differentiate between things we need and things we want. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't need smartphones. You, know, you don't need cable television. Uh, it's really interesting, you know, students will argue with me about that point. They'll say, no, you, you, people need a smartphone. And I'll say, well, you can't, I don't think you could need something that didn't exist 15 years ago. Right. <laughs> so one of the first things, if somebody's in a lot of debt and they're trying to make their way out, first thing you need to do is ask yourself, these things that I'm spending money on, do I need those things? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the answer is no. You know, you don't need you know, an $85 a month smartphone plan. You could get a flip phone for $30 and use that extra money towards paying down mm -hmm. debt. You could cancel cable and replace it with Hulu for $9 a month or Netflix streaming for $9 a month. 
put an antenna up and see what you can get over the air. There's lots of channels, I have one. local channels. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so being able, paying attention and understanding that those little things can really add up. Mm -hmm. I always use the analogy when somebody's trying to pay down debt or improve their financial situation, it's like trying to lose weight. Because really to lose weight, there's only two ways you could do it. You either consume fewer calories or you burn more. Those are the only two options you have. There's no magic formula regardless of everybody that looks for a magic formula. And it's the same way in personal finance. The only way to get yourself out of debt or the only way to improve your personal financial situation is to make more money or to spend less. And for many people, making more money, they're kind of limited to their jobs, mm -hmm. Uh, there's usually a ceiling in terms of raises that they're going to get. So for most people, the most viable option is to reduce the amount of money that's being spent. Okay. So do you have any, I know it's scary, but sometimes you may have to lay out all your debt and see it mm -hmm. in black and white. I think yes. that is a reality check for people. Yes. And with my advisory clients, one of the first things I'll do is put together a personal balance sheet for them. Mm -hmm. And it always amazes me how many people, the first time they look at that sheet, they're amazed because they'll tell me this is the first time in my life I've had all of this information on one page. Mm -hmm. So it does help to list your debts, to list your assets, and to move forward from there. Uh, another thing that I think is valuable in trying to get out of debt and controlling spending, again, going back to the weight loss analogy, uh, usually anytime somebody is wanting to start losing weight, I remember as an undergrad taking a nutrition class and the mm -hmm. teacher said, you know, don't make any changes, just write everything down for a month and look at how many calories you're taking in. And of course, when you do that, it's, for me, it was eye-opening because I didn't realize, you know, sometimes you just get in a habit without thinking just of it. Putting stuff in your mouth, just like you're going to lunch, going out to lunch, buying this here, there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell people, you know, budgeting, I think, is an intimidating process mm -hmm. for a lot of people. And I always tell them, start with, just write down everything you spend every day, put it into a spreadsheet, total it up at the end of the month. And I think many people are amazed at, you know, how much money they spend on things like going out to eat at restaurants or entertainment or cable television. Mm -hmm. So I think writing everything down gives people an idea of where they need to cut back. Mm -hmm. It's and the only way you're gonna see it in black and white. It is, and freeing up that money and using it to pay down debt is gonna pay dividends because as your debt balance gets smaller, as you start knocking out payments, or as you start knocking out debts, those payments that you were putting towards those debts, you could free up towards paying down other debts. So. so you had said before there's important numbers that people should be concerned with. Maybe not so much the price gallon of gas, but mm -hmm. you said interest rates. Mm -hmm. Should you look at all your debts? Maybe you got four credit cards. Look at what those interest rates are. Absolutely. I think, well, with credit cards, unfortunately, oftentimes you're stuck. You know, you could yeah. do a 0% transfer, but then you have fees associated mm -hmm. with that. But you know, a big one is with a mortgage. You know, many people will have a mortgage that, you know, they're still paying five or six percent on their mortgage where they could refinance their mortgage for 15 years. You know, rates right now are about, you know, hovering between three and three and a quarter for a 15 year fixed rate mortgage. Moving from a five and a half to six percent rate down to three is going to save somebody thousands of dollars per year. Depen potentially will save them thousands of dollars per year depending on their mortgage balance. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about paying down the debt so you get mm -hmm. that. The next thing you said is an emergency fund. Talk yes. to us about that. Uh, one of the very first things when somebody comes into my office as an advisory client and we're looking at their financial situation, again, we talked about getting your financial house in order. One of the big ones is having an emergency fund. Now the amount you should have varies from person to person mm -hmm. is a general rule. This isn't scientific. This is just <laughs> general guideline. I always tell people if you have one income earner in your household that six months of your living expenses should be set aside in cash. Mm -hmm. If you have two income earners, I encourage people to sock away three months of living expenses. And that's, that's a lot. <laughs> it is. And when people look at the amount of money, it's a large amount, but it comes down to what I call as long as mentality versus if then mentality. Mm -hmm. Talk so many, a little bit about more, more about that. That's a great way of thinking. So many Americans operate based on as long as mentality. For example, a lot of student, or a lot of younger professionals, you know, 22, 23, 24, uh, I see it a lot with, you know, accounting and finance graduates. They get a good job and they're very excited to be finally making money and they want to get a house. And oftentimes they'll buy more house than I think they could afford. Mm -hmm. A general guideline I recommend to people is Conservatively, two times your income is the most expensive house you should purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to be a little more aggressive, I think two and a half times is okay. 
but I'll see people, and I've seen financial writers say it's okay to go three and a half to four times your salary for a house because you'll get raises every year, and yes, it's too much house now, but as yeah, long as, as long as, as long as you get your 6% pay raise every year, mm -hmm. well, in five years, you'll be making 33% more than you do now. So as long as you keep getting that 6% pay raise, you'll be able to afford your house mm -hmm. in five years. But people don't understand how many implicit assumptions are built into that one assumption of as long as I get a 6% pay raise. They don't realize that they might not get a 6% pay raise. It could be less. They might not get a pay raise at all. Or not only will they, the possibility of a 0% pay raise, they could get a pay cut. They could be furloughed. Even worse, they could be laid off. Mm -hmm. So that one, as long as I make, as long as I receive a 6% pay raise every year, there's essentially four implicit assumptions in there. And so when you get into as long as mentality, I think you're building a very delicate house of cards and any slight unexpected emergency is gonna knock them all down. Mm -hmm. So the reason an emergency fund is important is in my experience, and I'm sure most people could relate to this, emergencies don't come along on a nice, predictable no, schedule. Don't. When it rains, it pours. <laughs> That's exactly right. It was about a year and a half ago, the hot water heater went out at my place. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's $500 to buy and install a new water heater. And literally one week later, I take my truck to the shop and they say, well, it's time for a new set of tires and it's time for uh, you know, a transmission service, which was another $500 expense. Mm -hmm. So there was $1,000 in unexpected expenses immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice if they came along exactly every three <laughs> months, you know, on the 15th day of the month, but that's why you need that emergency mm -hmm. fund. And that gets into if then mentality. Okay, let's get into that then. So instead of saying, you know, as long as I get my 6% pay raise every year, uh, you can get into what I like to call if then mentality, which is a much stronger place to be financially. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of saying, well, as long as I get my 6% pay raise every year, of course, there's a possibility, of what if you get injured and you're not able to work? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in my case, if I become disabled and can no longer work, then I will have a disability insurance policy which will pay me while I'm not working. Mm -hmm. um, if my hot water heater you know, quits in the same week that I have a $500 service in my truck, then I will take the money out of my emergency fund. Mm -hmm. So having living based on if-then mentality put you in a much stronger place as opposed to living based on as long as mentality. All right, so let's talk a little bit about using credit to your benefit, because we all mm -hmm. know that you need some credit and credit history. Mm -hmm. The problem is we tend to sometimes as Americans put everything on credit mm -hmm. and that hurts us by having so many. So what are some ways that we can use credit to benefit us later? Well, credit is something you have to be very careful about using credit. Mm -hmm. So. You know, some people can have a credit card and be responsible with it. Other people will have a credit card and be irresponsible with it. There's so many things that, you know, we have in our culture where some people could use it responsibly, some people can't. You know, some people could, you know, go to, you know, Las Vegas and play the slot machines for 30 minutes and go home. Other people are going to be there all night. So it's, you have to be very careful with credit, but at the same time, it's important to be aware of your credit, but I think many people place too much emphasis on building credit and having a strong credit score. Mm -hmm. You want to have credit, but in terms of a credit score, I think many people overemphasize that importance. Mm -hmm. uh, the highest FICO credit score you could obtain is 850. And many people are obsessive about getting to that 850. Mm -hmm. They look at their score every day. <laughs> they sign up for the you know daily, the daily. email summaries. Mm -hmm. But the reality is at a score of 780 or higher, somebody with a score of 840 versus somebody with a score of 780, they're not gonna get a major difference in interest rates. In fact, in many cases, they, there's gonna be no difference in interest okay. rates. So it's, it's good to know your credit score, but don't be obsessed by it. Exactly, <laughs> and a little bit of credit is okay. Mm -hmm. you know, if somebody has maybe, you know, they took out a car loan and you know, the interest rate is uh, very low. In that case, it might be okay to leave it there and make the minimum payments and do other things with your money. But mm -hmm. somebody that has you know, a car loan with a huge monthly payment and a huge student loan payment and, you know, a huge mortgage payment. That person needs to get aggressive about paying those down. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about prioritizing. Yes. <laughs> That's important because you may have mortgage or rent and student loans and living expenses and credit and how do you, what, what comes first? Well, number one, I always tell people, you know, I see a lot of people that come into my office that are 
close to the age where they should retire and they can't because they've been you know paying for college for their kids or you know paying expenses for their kids or for their parents and they're not taking care of themselves and it sounds incredibly selfish but you've got to take care of yourself first because if you don't you're just going to be a burden for those around you so I always like to use the oxygen mask rule you know when you get on an airplane they tell you in case of emergency the flight mask will come down <laughs> And they always say, secure your own mask before you try and help somebody next to you. Mm -hmm. And I use that analogy when it comes to personal finances. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. Make sure that you have your own house in order and that you're on track for retirement before you help, you know, before you start saving for your kid's retirement or before you lend a friend money or anything like that. Always take care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, and of course, the priorities are number one, I encourage people to get an emergency fund. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, if they have a large debt load, which you know, seems like it could become problematic if there's anything like a job loss, then I will strongly encourage them to pay down that debt. Mm -hmm. But if somebody has a good emergency fund, their debt is down to a manageable level, uh, then I think they're ready to start saving and planning for retirement. When you say getting your debt down to a certain level, we mm -hmm. hear sometimes, you know, debt to income ratio. How do you know if your debt is at an acceptable level? I'm glad you mentioned that because <laughs> there is so much information out there and it's all opinion. There is no scientific, I can prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the magic number. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's opinion. And it worries me that in our culture, you know, many banks will tell you that having a total debt to income ratio, meaning your mortgage, your housing payments, you know, principal, interest, insurance and taxes, as well as credit card debt, student loan debt, et cetera. Many banks will tell you, you know, take, your, take all of those payments, divide by your gross monthly income. Some banks will tell you that 39% or less is where you wanna aim. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was before the financial crisis, after banks started saying, you know, 30 to 35% <laughs> maybe is better. And now that the economy's starting to pick up, banks are starting to raise that level. Uh, I saw an article in an issue of a widely read publication, Money Magazine. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about, you know, should you borrow money to pay for your kid's college? And one of the factors they said was, will your debt load relative to your income be 45% or less, mm -hmm. which, I think is far too high. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, I think people sh should shoot for everything, cars, student loans, mortgage, everything. In my opinion, 25% or less is where people okay. should, should aim, which is much lower than what you know, conventional wisdom, you know, bankers, et cetera, will tell you. But I think that's a nice, healthy level that will allow you to start saving for retirement, will allow you to start saving for kids' education. Let's talk a little bit about student loans because that's something a lot mm -hmm. of people have. Some people start off their early careers with student loans, some, some last a long time. That's something you cannot not pay for. Mm -hmm. How can you, any advice on how to manage that student loan payment because it has to be paid off mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that um, maybe you're not paying so much interest. It's always going to be there. So mm -hmm. what advice do you have? Well, there are income-based repayment plans now, mm -hmm. but it all comes back to what we were talking about earlier. Make sure you differentiate needs versus wants. Uh -huh. When I came out of grad school, I did take out some student loan debt for living expenses when I was a grad assistant. And when I graduated, that was my number one priority. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of having no debt. Right now, my only debt is my mortgage. Mm -hmm. So when I came out of grad school, I was very adamant about getting it paid off as quickly as possible. I packed my lunch to work every day at Eastern. I didn't have wireless internet at my place. I didn't have, I still don't have cable television. I didn't have a smartphone. I lived, you know, I made sure that I was satisfying my needs, but any wants I was setting aside so I could pay off my student loan debt. So make sure, again, things that, you're consi uh, that you consider needs, make sure those aren't indeed luxuries, because things like cable television, a smartphone, you know, we get spoiled, I think, in this country, and we don't realize that those things are luxuries. All right, so let me ask your opinion about this. Most people need a vehicle. Sure. Are you one that advocates buy a vehicle, pay it off, keep driving it, or should you, as soon as it's paid off, get something else? What, what are your thoughts on vehicles? Well, it's, it's interesting you said that. Uh, I mentioned I have an advisory firm in Kentucky. I teach here in Illinois, so I commute quite a bit. And I guess. <laughs> last year in December, uh, I had a, a car, and uh, there were two deer in the interstate. Couldn't avoid hitting one, and I totaled my car. And so when it came time for my next car, 
again, this is as long as versus if then. Mm -hmm. I had the cash in the bank to write a check for a replacement car. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big believer if you can't write a check for a car, you shouldn't buy it. I don't believe in leases. I don't believe in car loans. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in saving up money and then writing a check for a car. Okay. So real quick, lease versus, let's say you don't have the money okay. um, to, to buy a car. You mm -hmm. have to have one. Um, at certain times, it seems like lease payments are really cheap. And lease or buy, what's your opinion? Well, I'm a big fan of buy. I meet a lot of people that will lease a car and they'll try and convert me to you know, the church of leasing. They'll uh -huh. say, it's such a great deal. My payment's only this amount. Yeah. And every person, they come back you know, three years later, four years later, and they say, man, this is terrible. I, I have a car, but you know, five months from now, I'm not going to have a car and I've got nothing to show for it. What should I do now? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people will be big advocates of leasing when they get their first car. And then at the end of the lease, I'll come back and talk to the same people and they're ready to buy a car. Okay. So uh, Dr. Locke, in these last few minutes, give us some other advice or kind of summarize uh, some things that you wanted to talk about. Well, again, the big thing is differentiating wants versus needs. Mm -hmm. and the biggest issue by far is paying attention mm -hmm. because I always tell people it's not enough to take care of the financial problems you have right now because there's going to be more problems coming at you in the future. <laughs> there's, you know, for a 23, 24 year old that graduates, yes, you might have your financial house in order, but what about, you know, when kids come along? What about saving for college for your kids? What about saving for your own retirement? Mm -hmm. You know, a general rule of thumb that I like to use is by the time you are 30 years old, I think you should have about one times your annual income saved for retirement. Mm -hmm. When you're 35, it should be two times. When you're 40, it should be three times. When you're 45, it should be four times, et cetera. Again, that's a general guideline. That's not a hard and fast rule. Mm -hmm. I can't prove it mathematically, <laughs> but it's just a general guideline that I like to recommend for people. Mm -hmm. So I think just hearing that for a lot of people will sometimes will, I hate to use the word, scare them into savings, but I think motivate them into saving for retirement. And again, going back, writing down your expenses, differentiating, wants versus needs, make sure you're living based on an if then mentality instead of a as long as mentality. And getting your financial house in order and moving on to the next step of saving for retirement. So you make sure that you don't run out of money before you run out of life. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Locke, if someone out there is watching and this is so overwhelming because they feel so far down in the hole, what kind of psychology, I'm gonna pull from your <laughs> psychology background, sure. can you give, can you think about to get yourself out of that financial hole and getting things back in order. You've got to get started. Yeah. And it's important to get those small victories under your belt, mm -hmm. even if it's just paying down that credit card a little bit, even if it's just a matter of you know, canceling your smartphone plan and getting you know, a cheap flip phone, mm -hmm. even if it's canceling your cable so you have that extra $60. It's, again, just like getting in shape physically, you know, some people are intimidated to start working mm -hmm. out, but it's a matter of you know just go for a walk, yeah. do something to get some victories behind your belt so you could get some momentum and carry that momentum into knocking out the rest of your financial goals. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I could speak from experience when it comes to savings. Uh, when I started at Eastern, I maxed out my retirement plan. And it's one of those things I never thought about. The money just came out. I never missed it because it was never there. And it's something where once you get in the habit of doing it, it doesn't feel like you're doing it. And then you know, every now and then, you know, I'll go online and check my account and you know, I'm amazed at how much that compounding and that savings is working to my benefit. So I always tell people, don't look at the final destination because you're going to get intimidated. Just focus on, you know, set goals, set priorities, and just focus on making progress. All right, Dr. Locke, great information to get our Money in, the po money in Your Pocket series started. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. On today's bottom line, remember that the best way to get control over your finances is to consider it like dieting. Earn more and or spend less. This way you can hope to cut the financial fat from your budget. Also, Dr. Locke recommends you think about any expenditure as a want or a need. We may all want that fancy car, but do we need it? If you can weed out the wants and get by with the needs, you'll be well on your way to financial wellness. And finally, expect those unexpected expenses. The bad things for your budget never happen on schedule, so have a rainy day fund that you won't tap into unless you need it. Well, that's our show for this week. We hope you'll join us each week as we learn several more ways to keep more money in your pocket. 
This program is made possible in part by Credit Union One. Proud to support money in your pocket, Credit Union One offers savings and lending options. Additional information on membership available at creditunionone.org. Loans subject to approval. Accounts are insured up to $250,000. By member's choice, this institution is not federally insured.